Good morning. I'm Lisa John, Secretary General of the Civicus Alliance. Some of you know Civicus. Uh, it's a worldwide network of civil society organizations and activists uh, who are committed to protecting and expanding civic space and the relevance of civil society. So I'm here uh, today to really talk about the challenges, but also the opportunities that we have to uh, invest in civil society and really protect their important work. Uh, to begin with, I'd like to say that it's particularly important for me to have this space to be here because we need Norway and more progressive states like Norway to do their bit in reinforcing the relevant contribution that civil society makes. Uh, so we know that for governments, uh, you know, the, the work that civil society does in creating space for participation, for engagement, uh, for sustainable alternatives, uh, it's, it's, it's a, it's not, it's an end, civil society is an end in itself, but its work really is a public good uh, that actually enables and reinforces the good work of governments themselves. So, uh, effectively, we do see uh, the partnerships that need to exist between government and civil society, but also civil society and other parts of uh, you know, uh, society is extremely important, particularly at this uh, point in time. Uh, I'm going to start off by talking about uh, a few trends we've observed in the last decade. Uh, we have an annual state of civil society report and, and, and did a 10-year analysis of the key themes uh, in civic space, which is effectively the enabling uh, environment or the operating environment for civil society and includes uh, you know, the three fundamental freedoms, which are the freedom of expression, the freedom of peaceful assembly, and the freedom of association. Uh, so many of the trends are, are, are you know, kind of uh, themes that we are very familiar with. The two that I really want to bring out uh, to attention are the, ro the increasing role of the private sector, so the rise of ultra-capitalism and the rise of the disinformation economy. And then contradictory to that, uh, also the emergence of new frontiers and new uh, you know, areas of civic action and engagement. So, on one hand, we, you're seeing the challenges for civic space increasing in terms of both political and economic, uh, you know, uh, contradictions or, or opposition. But on the other hand, you have a much larger force uh, of civic actors than ever before in recent history that's really determined to uphold values, to find alternatives and ensure that we are, uh, you know, committed or, or we are reaching the kind of values of social, economic and environmental justice uh, that, that we talk about and, and, and which is fundamental to the future of human societies. So, um, Civicus also uh, publishes an annual uh, report on the state of civic freedoms uh, through the Civicus Monitor. And in the map that you uh, see here, you know, uh, what's, what's clearly apparent is that there's an increasing number of countries, in fact, most uh, of, of the world's population that lives in contexts where civic space is either completely closed or uh, it's restricted and obstructed. So only 3.1% of the world's population lives in contexts where they can fully exercise their civic freedoms. Uh, Norway is one of those countries where, uh, you know, civic freedoms are rated as open. And therefore, I think, again, uh, you know, the, the, really the, the moral responsibility, the political responsibility to reinforce the importance of civil society and civic space. Uh, of course, we've seen, uh, you know, uh, that in, in recent years, uh, the linkages between the enjoyment of civic freedoms or the, the ability to exercise, uh, you know, or the ability to, to enjoy civic space and the connection with uh, the complex and, and, and global challenges that we have faced has been very visible. So, on one hand, in the context of the pandemic, you're able to see that uh, the, the opportunity or the restrictions on civil society have had a direct impact on how governments or other agencies have been held accountable to delivering their role for societies in, in the pandemic response. But similarly, and even in the context of the current conflict we see between Russia and Ukraine, yeah, there is a clear link between the dismantling of independent civil society, independent media, uh, and you know opportunities for checks and balances in the political domain, and the rise of authoritarian powers and, and the ability of countries then to really go rogue on the rest of the world in terms of uh, imposing uh, their military uh, you know powers and, and, and their, their kind of authoritarian notions of how the world should operate. Um, 
So uh, we, we have seen that in the recent past, there's been an increased number of attacks on whistleblowers, on civil society, uh, you know, activists and uh, on human rights defenders. In fact, att attacks against um, the freedom of peaceful assembly have been at an all time high uh, during uh, the pandemic period. But you've also seen many governments, including established democracies like Spain and the UK, introduce proposals that fundamentally challenged established civic freedoms uh, which have been celebrated and, and nurtured uh, across uh, the existence of their countries. So, um, uh, you know, in effect, I think the various ways in which restrictions on civic space have played out have had a devastating effect on civil society's ability to organize and, and work towards uh, its intended outcomes. Uh, you've had several countries, um, you know, experiencing or, or the introduction of laws that deliberately restrict local civil society from accessing uh, information, from accessing resources, from engaging and collaborating with wider actors. And, and, and the, uh, you know, the, the, the real challenge or, uh, you know, the tragedy in that is that particularly during the pandemic, you've seen that it has been local civil society that has been at the forefront of responding to the needs of communities. Uh, so instead of being, uh, you know, their efforts being reinforced and celebrated and sustained, you're actually seeing them being restricted, curtailed and, you know, intimidated and harassed for simply uh, stepping up uh, in order to respond to uh, the needs of their own uh, communities and publics. So um, I think finally, just to say that, you know, uh, the, the landscape, of course, for civil society is at an extremely challenging point uh, right now. But there have also been very many specific examples of how governments uh, and other parts of society can better support civil society, even in the context of a a period like the pandemic. Uh, so uh, Civicus was part of a study along with other networks, uh, which we, you know, the findings of which we published in a report called Rebuilding for Good. And there were six very clear recommendations based on concrete examples of support and solidarity to civil society that uh, emerged from the study. The first, of course, was the need to remove restrictions and to amplify the value of the contributions that civil society makes. Uh, the second was the ability to support civil society to reduce and remove operating costs in, in very many, uh, you know, specific and practical ways. Uh, the third is the ability to provide flexibility for regulatory requirements and therefore give civil society the breathing space they need to focus on their mandate uh, without being, you know, overwhelmed by the logistical and reporting demands that, uh, that many uh, donors and supporters place on them. Uh, the fourth was the need to look at mechanisms for stimulus and, uh, and, and sustained support, right? So through subsidies. So in the context of the pandemic, uh, you know, the examples where countries had stepped in and provided the same kind of financial support uh, and support, you know, to, to retain, uh, you know, talent and, and to, to retain employees that they would to another sector and the need to kind of take that forward and ensure that civil society is being treated uh, with, with the same kind of recognition and respect that, uh, you know, governments would accord to other agencies or other uh, sectors. Uh, the fifth was uh, really the need to look at the infrastructure that civil society needs to operate and not assume that that's going to happen informally or uh, that needs to be, you know, kind of replicated uh, in an ad hoc way. So there are, you know, certain um, you know, structures, systems, um, tools, resources that all civil society uh, across the world needs in relation to access to information, collaborative frameworks, access to resources, access to, um, you know, uh, partnerships and, and the ability to uh, develop new and emerging strategies. And that's something that needs a direct and formal investment and, and, and shouldn't be assumed um, or, or left to chance. And then finally, uh, really the need to recognize that civil society exists uh, to contribute to sustainable alternatives. There are certain roles such as its watchdog role or its role uh, in challenging, uh, you know, established norms or, or structures, especially those that uh, are, are a deviation from the way in which societies need to work that no other, you know, sector can play as effectively as a civil society. So th there's really a need, uh, you know, to, to continue to empower civil society, to continue to 
look at uh, an effective and networked civil society as a public good uh, that, that needs you know, the attention uh, and the recognition that it deserves. So, uh, to end, um, there is a lot to be done, there is a lot that can be done. There is a, a balance between the kind of actions that need to be taken locally, which are much more uh, relevant to the operating environment, uh, to you know, incentivizing public giving and solidarity and the, op the infrastructure that civil society needs. But there is also an equally important role that needs to be played globally, uh, which is really in the defense and application of international norms for human rights, uh, as well as uh, you know, the focus on uh, resilience, uh, innovation and long-term sustainability that should be part and parcel of all of our work and dialogues at uh, global and regional levels as well.